Welcome to the biology unit of the St. Louis County Police Department. In the biology unit, we are internationally accredited and we also work cases such as property crimes and crimes against persons. But wait, before we come into the lab, you have to wear personal protective equipment. We always wear a lab coat, a face mask, and gloves. For purposes of the video today, I will not be wearing a face mask. Anyone coming into the lab must submit a DNA sample for elimination purposes. The biology DNA unit is one section. The biologist handles screening the evidence for blood, semen, saliva. We also get evidence with trace samples such as sweat that is left behind and skin cells. In addition to screening for biological fluids, the biology section is also responsible for triaging the evidence. Not all evidence collected at a crime scene may be relevant to the crime. The biologists decide what items should be tested and which body fluid. A portion is then placed into a tube, which will then go through the DNA process. You will learn more about that soon. The cases in biology take a few hours to a few days to complete, depending on how much evidence is submitted. Despite what you see on CSI, this all takes time. After the biologist finishes the work in the actual laboratory, a biology report is written, and if the case included evidence that needed to be tested for body fluids, then that report must be reviewed by another biologist for quality control. The biologist also may be needed to testify in court about their findings. Let's take a look at some of the tests the biologists perform to identify bodily fluids. For example, this piece of carpet, you can't see anything with the naked eye, but when we use the alternate light source, as you see, the stain becomes visible. After the alternate light source, the swabbing of the stain is then tested with STMP reagent. A blue color change indicates a presumptive positive result for seminal fluid. When screening for blood, the IR light is a tool used to locate blood on dark or colored objects. The phenolphthalein test is a sensitive but not specific test used to detect hemoglobin in blood. Another commonly used reagent to detect blood is luminol. Luminol is used as an investigative aid to detect blood that is not visible with the naked eye. It is commonly used to detect blood at crime scenes that may have been cleaned up. The amylase diffusion test is a presumptive test used to indicate whether an elevated level of amylase exists in an unknown stain or swab. If so, this may indicate the presence of saliva. To perform this test, a small sample is extracted in sterile water for approximately 45 to 60 minutes. Small holes are then punched in a gel plate using a pipette to produce a well, which is approximately 2 millimeters in diameter. The samples are then placed in the wells using a pipette. Each well holds approximately 4 microliters of liquid. The petri dish is then placed inverted in an incubator at approximately 37 degrees Celsius for two to six hours, or it can be stored at room temperature overnight. The plate is then stained by pouring a dilution of saturated iodine solution over the gel surface and then rinsed with water. A clearing around a well indicates areas of amylase activity. The diameter of the clear circle is proportional to the square root of the concentration of amylase. An approximate measurement of the diameter of each ring present is then taken and noted. A positive sample is when the ring size is equal or greater in size than the positive control. If the ring is less than the positive control, but greater than the negative control, it is inconclusive. A negative result would be the absence of any clear ring. The HEMDIRECT test works similar to a COVID test and is a confirmatory test for blood of probable human origin. It is not considered a confirmatory test for species due to the fact that some upper primates and under some conditions, ferrets have been reported giving positive results with the HEMDIRECT card. This test is performed by cutting a very small portion of the sample to be tested. The sample is then added to the extraction buffer. The sample is vortexed and sits at room temperature for approximately 10 minutes. The tip is then snapped off of the top and several drops from the dropper of the extracted sample are added to the sample well of the testing device. We wait 10 minutes to read the results. A pink line in the control and test column indicate a positive result. After the items have been screened and sampled, they are placed into these tubes. These tubes are then placed in the freezer for the DNA analysis. 
Hi, my name is Justin Louts. I'm a forensic DNA analyst with the St. Louis County Police Department Crime Laboratory. And we're gonna do a brief tour of the lab and the things that we do in the DNA analysis unit. So come along, let's take a quick tour. But before we go into the lab, we have to put on personal protective equipment. And that is going to protect us from the evidence and the evidence from us. Normally I would wear a face mask, but we're gonna take special considerations today where I will not have to wear a face mask. Our primary responsibilities in the DNA analysis unit is to take items of evidence that have been previously analyzed in our biology unit and perform DNA analyses on them. For this position, there are specific educational requirements. You must have a bachelor's degree in a biology, chemistry, or forensic related area. The degree must include coursework, graduate or undergraduate level, in biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology, and statistics or population genetics. In addition, extensive on-the-job training is required and typically takes anywhere from one to two years to complete. So what is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and is contained in every nucleated cell in your body. Half of it comes from your mother and half of it comes from your father. It's essentially your genetic blueprint. It dictates your chemical composition as well as your physical appearance. The first step in this process is extraction. This is where we are going to clean the sample as well as get DNA into solution or what we call the lysate. Here we have an analyst adding reagents in the first step of the extraction process. We need to remove the proteins, cell membranes, and other parts of the sample that we're not interested in. This step is called extraction because we're extracting the DNA from the sample. In our laboratory, robotics do the final extraction step in our process. This is performed on the Kyogen EZ-1, as well as the Tekken Evo Freedom 100 liquid automation instrument. Once the robots are completed with the extraction process, the sample is then eluted in about 50 microliters of sample, about the equivalent of a raindrop. The next step of the process actually takes place in a different room in the laboratory. This is known as the pre-amplification room. And this next step we're going to embark on is quantitation. And quantitation is exactly that. It is determining how much DNA was in the sample that we just recovered during the extraction step. Some samples contain large amounts of DNA, while others contain only a few cells and may not have enough DNA to get a usable result. For the quantitation assay, a tiny portion of the 50 microliter DNA extract is taken and placed into a PCR plate along with special reagents. We use real-time PCR instruments to perform the quantitation step. As the quantitation reagents copy certain areas of the DNA molecules in the sample, a fluorescent signal is emitted. The relative brightness of the signal is measured by the instrument and is converted into an estimate of how much DNA is present in each sample. The third step in the process is amplification. If you could think of your genome as a book, there's only certain pages of that book that we're interested in to make a forensic identification. This process is in part thanks to polymerase chain reaction. During the PCR process, fluorescent tags are added to the DNA fragments as they are being copied. A specific volume of the DNA extract is added to a PCR plate containing the amplification reagents. The volume of DNA extract used depends upon the quantitation results. The instrument used to perform the PCR process is called a thermocycler. It contains an extremely precise heat block that raises and lowers the temperature of the samples at specific times. During this process, the DNA is heated to near boiling temperatures the last step of the process is to detect the sample fragments that were amplified and fluorescently tagged. This process is known as capillary electrophoresis, or CE. An instrument called a genetic analyzer is used to separate the DNA fragments by size as the fragments pass through the capillary. The smaller fragments move more quickly and are detected before the larger fragments near the end of the capillary. A laser excites the fluorescent tags, causing them to emit light. This light is captured by a highly specialized CCD camera that collects the light emission data. This data is converted into a DNA profile by genotyping software. Once the samples have finished processing on the CE instrument, the data is analyzed in a program called FASTER. This software takes the light emission data from the genetic analyzer and converts it into DNA data that the analyst can interpret. The DNA analyst evaluates the data to determine if sufficient data was developed from the samples. If enough data was recovered, they determine the number of contributors in the DNA sample. DNA samples often contain DNA from more than one individual. This is called a mixture. Some mixtures are simple, while others are more complex. Depending on how many individuals are present and how much DNA each person contributed, it may not be possible to determine if a specific person is present in a mixture. Other DNA samples have no DNA at all, or only a few peaks that are not enough to be useful. Samples that are able to be interpreted can be compared to known DNA profiles from individuals in the case. If associations or matches are considered relevant in the context of the case, 
statistics are applied to help the jury understand how strong or weak the association is. This is where a software program called STRMix is used. STRMix is a highly validated software that implements the most modern DNA interpretation methods. The software untangles complex DNA mixtures and resolves them into a list of genotype combinations that best explains the DNA profile. These combinations are compared to DNA profiles from individuals in the case to determine the potential source of the crime scene sample. When an association is made and the association is relevant in the context of the case, a statistic called a likelihood ratio is calculated using STRMix. The statistics aid the jury by providing weight to the association. It helps the jury understand if the association is strong or possibly weak. These results are summarized in the DNA report. Prior to release, a second qualified analyst must review all the lab work as well as the results, interpretations, and conclusions contained in the DNA report. In some cases, some samples can be entered into a DNA database where they can be compared upon other evidentiary samples and known standards. This is known as the Combined DNA Indexing System, or CODIS for short. Federal law dictates who has access to the CODIS database and what information is allowed to be entered. DNA data entered in the database contains only the DNA profile and sample identification numbers, but unlike what you see on crime dramas, does not contain any personally identifiable information. When a match is made, the labs involved must correspond to determine whether or not it is a true hit. If determined as a true hit, this can give investigators an investigative lead. Thanks for coming along in this unique opportunity to see the inner workings of our DNA lab. As you can tell, the road to getting a DNA profile is long and nothing like you see on TV.